So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mélène Larchevêque. I'm a French student at Etcher University. And now it's time for the panel discussion entitled The Future of the Palestinian Past. So each professor will be able to speak for around 10 minutes and then I will open up to discussion or question. And I am happy to introduce first Professor Sharon Sekely from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you for having uh, us Californians. Um, both Amanda and I are zooming in from another coast altogether, um, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, I have been really um, lucky to both be mentored by and work us alongside um, Rashid Khalidi, and through that, um, sort of mentorship and um, collaborative work, I've come to understand Palestine not as an exception, a problem or a burden, but a set of offerings on both method and content. And in my comments today, I'm going to focus on um, three different uh, kind of uh, offerings of that sort. Um, one is the question of time. The second is the practice of collaborative work. And the third is the idea of the archive. And I wanna say that I'm really honored to be here also with Amanda, um, who is uh, someone I've been very lucky to build with um, in one of the collectives that I'm gonna be talking about today. I want to first commend um, the framing of this roundtable because I think the um, to imagine the future of Palestine's past is a really beautiful invitation, and it opens us up um, with this question of time. How do we explore this question of time? And I want to step back and and just think together with you about how both the pandemic as well as the kind of global right wing ascendancy has produced a vortex in which time is at once elongated and condensed, rapidly mobile and static. And in the United States, um, or Turtle Island, uh, as, as um, uh, indigenous uh, organizers and scholars invite us to think about the past of the um, settler spaces we inhabit. Four years of the US administrations, the previous administration, um, assault on daily life from the celebration of misogyny to sexual assault, um, to the travel ban on Muslims, to the denigration of people with disabilities, alongside a kind of formal and informal instigation and institutionalization of homophobia, anti-Blackness, and white supremacy. All of these really set the stage for a temporal whirlwind. And COVID-19 added this other layer of time standing still, a kind of permanent temporary. Um, at the same time, I think it was really important to keep in mind that temporal deviations both um, expressed and fortified multiple different kinds of reckonings, whether it was economic upheaval, relentless climate, climate catastrophe, the daily state sanctioned assassination of black men and women in the United States. So really, we've been kind of living this rolling and overlapping set of crises. And they these crises laid bare multiple settler imaginaries of land and territory, of time and the future. We know that experiences of time, land, and dispossession are differentiated. Indigenous intellectual Chelsea Vowell teaches us that timelines of catastrophe center settler imaginaries. And, you know, Indigenous people um, often say, you know, we've lived through multiple ends already. And in the words of Kyle White, um, they say, quote, Indigenous peoples already inhabit what our ancestors would have likely characterized as a dystopian future. So we consider the future from what we believe is already a dystopia. 
Palestine has a lot to teach us about our present condition of the permanent temporary. Unclear what the future holds, suspended in time without an end in sight, and uncertain what the quote unquote normal we will return to will look like. For some, this condition of cyclical and ongoing crisis is a rupture. For many throughout Turtle Island and globally, and certainly for Palestinians, it is a way of life. Violence and dispossession are not interruptions, but rather markers of the temporal and spatial suspension that constitute the everyday. And here I wanna go back a little bit historically to think about this condition of temporal and spatial suspension. The British mandate in Palestine envisioned a future for the land, but not for its people. From the Permanent Mandates Commission's perspective, these Palestinians kept the country in a state of stagnation. The land needed, quote, an able and energetic people to facilitate its arrival to a modern temporality. So here we can think about the ways that during this period, and you know, I'll be happy to talk more about this if people are interested, how the future for Palestinians was held in suspension, how they inhabited a temporality of deferral, of permanent abeyance. Uh, British officials sought to simply maintain the status quo for Palestinian Muslims and Christians. Don't develop, don't invest, don't fund. And given the Brad British mandate's commitment to the Jewish national home policy, the Palestinians could never be developmental subjects. It was only the Great Revolt of 1936 to 1939 and later World War II that would force British colonial officials to invest in some form of Palestinian developmentalism. British rule was so parsimonious that it was only when war induced new capital flows, which facilitated Palestinians escape from indebtedness that many villages paved roads and built schools. Of course, urban, middle, and upper-class Palestinians did not have these problems. They could draw on broad networks of infrastructures, missionary, and otherwise. At the same time, Palestinians of all classes struggled for their present and nourished heterogeneous visions of the future, but their possibilities were increasingly foreclosed. Palestinians were dispossessed and their homeland dismembered. Scholars usually think of the conditions of presence, absence, and temporal abeyance as beginning after 1948 with the permanent temporariness of refugee life and the 1948 Israeli emergency regulation that shaped the Palestinian as present on the land but absent in the law. Neither this form of temporality nor this form of presence began in 1948. It was the British mandate and its embrace of Zionism that initiated the narrowing of subjectivities and temporalities and the troubled twin birth of the Israeli state and the Palestinian refugee condition would consolidate these constrictions. Of course, after 1948 for Palestinians, time shifted once again. It became suspended between crisis and stasis. Dispossession attempts to vanquish the past, to besiege the present, to foreclose the future. What Palestine, both in its past and its present, teach, teaches us is to stand in place in the face of the permanent temporary, in the face of suspension and abeyance, in, in the face of this prolonged and fragmented state of waiting. It teaches us to fight for shrinking returns and to plan for not for, but against that future of looped crisis, suspension, foreclosure, and dispossession. The reality of constant struggle can lead us to an insistence on specific moments and events. Part of, I think, the challenge for those of us who are studying Palestine um, and who are thinking about inhabiting and writing Palestinian time is really to reject these kinds of presentist approaches 
and to dig deep for history's possibilities and flaws. And it's this type of digging that can only really happen collaboratively and across generational divides. And here I'm really lucky to draw on three bodies of collaborative work that I am a member and a student of. The Journal of Palestine Studies, which I'm really honored to co-edit with um, Rashid Khalidi, the Palestine as Praxis Collective, which was born of the Unity Uprising, and the Palestinian Feminist Collective, um, the intergenerational group of Palestinian and Arab feminists, primarily located on Turtle Island, the unceded lands known as North America, that Amanda and I are both part of. In each of these spaces, I have come to learn that the future of the Palestinian past relies on some key lessons. The first, escaping the methodological and analytical confines of the nation state. Zionism isolates Palestine from its geography. The future of Palestine's past must diligently put Palestine back in to the multiple worlds it inhabited. The second, the centrality of self-critique uh, to envisioning futures. One of the traps of the colonial condition is to center the colonizer and the settler in our stories and our methods. But we have to remain vigilant to center the colonized and their own racialized, classed, and gendered legacies and realities. I'll give you here an example, um, which is the wonderful work that's come out on Black Palestine Solidarity and here I want to say that, you know, this work in the future and ongoing cannot only be a celebration of joint struggle, it must also address Black Zionism, U.S. imperialism, Palestinian anti-Blackness, the history of Indian Ocean slavery, the place of Blackness in the formation of an anti-colonial Arab subjectivity, right? So we have to ask the hard questions. We can't just ask the easy ones. Um, the third uh, lesson, and I think this is something that I've really, you know, been um, so just gifted with working with the Palestinian feminist um, collective on this, which is really to think of love as a method. In each of these collectives, I've come to learn that it is only from love love for the work, love for ideas, love for one another, that we can nurture defiance, resilience, hope, and struggle. The fourth is the importance of innovation and experimentation. Cumulative dispossession means being ready to take flight in a heartbeat, a refusal to be governed, the reality of collective punishment, it can also mean eclectic, fearless dances of defiance and experiments in being, in existence. And I think the idea of the future requires that we innovate, that we find new ways to think, to read, and to write the future. One of the main questions that has inspired my thinking has been the relationship between statelessness and archival practices. And I know Amanda's gonna talk more about archives. Um, I think we have to delve really creatively into how we might find new ways to think about um, the generations before us and their lessons and the generations to come. Um, and in some ways, I think not having an archive is both a burden and a blessing. And, and I'll be happy to um, talk more about this if people are interested. I, I think that the struggle for a name, for legibility, for possibility still defines Palestine and Palestinian studies. Evidentiary rigor is still a site of contestation and a politics of recognition still polices the truth content of historical writing. So here, you know, I'm gesturing to the ways that that massacres or dispossession or ethnic cleansing only become real through the evidentiary rigor of an Israeli document or an Israeli historian or an Israeli archive, right? I think we have to really pierce through that kind of political economy of knowledge production and recognition. And I think it's important therein to think about the battle for sovereignty as moving from land to text all the time. And that in these parallel and overlapping spaces of land and text, we can trace both internal and external contest contestations. Um, 
very various structural dualisms, right, between um, patriarchal state-centered structures and a radical imagination. And I think this is one of the things for the future that future generations of Palestine and Palestinian studies really have to struggle with. Are the legacies of our own patriarchal and state-centered structures, how do we dismantle them um, to take up the offerings that Palestine gives us? And I think in this sense, as you know, Amanda will speak much more powerfully than I can, that language itself is a battlefield and exceeds kind of that metaphorical power of language as, as, as a site of um, contestation. And I think most of all that, that envisioning um, both the future and the future of the Palestinian past really relies on a recognition that the generations before us and the generations to come themselves shape a capacious, contentious, and living archive. Thank you. Should I just jump in? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sekili. Um, and yeah, we'll now listen to Professor Amanda Batase from the University of California in San Diego. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us here. Um, and thank you, as always, uh, to Dr. Saipali for her insightful reflections. Um, I'll be building off of, of course, um, the points uh, noted by Dr. Saik Ghali on Palestinian time, collaborative work, and the idea of the archive, um, especially as she noted the, the archive. Um, I'll start, start there before moving into its relevance to Palestinian literature and the arts. So the tradition of communal and private libraries has a long history in Palestine and is no stretch uh, by no stretch of the imagination, a modern invention. And yet, as Rashid Khalidi addressed early on in his work, Locating historical materials after 1948 has presented a critical dilemma for Palestinian historians because this period commenced the settler colonial regime's systematic targeting, dismantling, and confiscation of the Palestinian archive. It is through the seizure of communal and personal library collections in and around 1948, such as the massive library of the poet and educator Khalil Sekakidi in Jerusalem and, and many, many others, that what is now called the National Library at Hebrew University established a collection of no less than 30,000 stolen books from Palestinian archives, homes, and personal libraries. The destruction or seizure of Palestinian historical materials is a critical means of obfuscating Palestinian history in a kind of ontological annihilation of Palestine. And this assault is an enduring tactic of Israeli settler colonialism. However, today as always, it is incumbent upon us to examine how Palestinians have not stopped archiving their histories and that these archives take numerous forms, not only because of the threat presented to the centralized physical archive, but also due to the nature of Palestinian cultural heritage that is composed of story traditions. So the physical archive, as I noted, has continued after 1948, such as that housed in the Palestine Research Center in Beirut, which was invaded during the Israeli siege of 1982 and all of its contents looted. Um, to more recently, the two famed bookstores in Gaza City containing tens of thousands of volumes, which were bombed to the ground by the Israeli army just last year in May 2021. I'm hesitant to call other forms of historical archiving practiced by Palestinians, which I'll get to in a second, um, as alternate methods, because I do not want to reinscribe a hierarchy that distinguishes between so-called objective historical documentation and subjective narrative. So I'll say instead that the modes of historic archive archiving in Palestinian communities are vast, one of which, and of course a critical component of which, is the physical archive produced through historical regenerative research by Palestinian historians like Rashid Khalidi and Dr. Shireen Saifali. Khalidi makes this very argument against institutional hierarchization in his critique, for instance, 
of the Israeli historian Benny Morris, who refused to use any oral testimonies, whether Palestinian or Israeli, in his research of the Nakba, and in so doing, marginalized Palestinian narrative entirely through his exclusive reference to colonial Israeli and British archival documents. So stepping back for a second, because I said storied cultural heritage, what do I mean by Palestinian storied cultural heritage? Narrative practice is embedded within Palestinian traditions, which archive the Palestinian history of contiguous presence upon the land and their multiple expulsions from it since 1948. As I've noted in some of my work on Palestinian land narrative, the spaces of Palestine are themselves storied. These are both popular and regionally specific narratives that evidence Palestinian presence through the continuation and regeneration of placemaking stories over generations. Also, the Palestinian practice of tatris or embroidery, for instance, is storied in that not only are the patterns themselves telling a story of place derived from the specific regions, plant life, animals, traditions, and topographies of Palestine, but they are also combined by their creators to produce unique visual narratives of both place within Palestine and in exile. We might even extend this further to include the cuisine of Palestine, which similarly tells the story of quite literally rooted practices. I bring up these forms of historical creative archival before more canonical forms, like for instance, the historical novel, because they illustrate how Palestinians have carried on the practice of storytelling, tethering them to the material space of Palestinian history outside the parameters of what we might define as conventional historical archives. Palestinian literature in a more conventional framing as poetry, short stories, novels, and memoir has also long, of course, been recognized as a mode of Palestinian narrative or poetic archiving. Key contributors like Mahmoud Darwish, Hassan Kanafani, and Sahar Khalifa, among many others, have preserved Palestinian historical narratives in literary archives, that is, where the work itself, as opposed to a physical library or research center, chronicles events of history that are fictionalized but not invented, a method akin to Sadia Hartman's critical fabulation as a space where violent erasure from the historical archive and speculative narrative meet. This relationship between literature and history, however, is not always an easy one. Where the strictures of Western frameworks upon these fields, history and literature, have delimited hard and fast lines between literary fiction and historical fact, much like Benny Morris's rejection of oral narrative in the historical record, Palestinian authors and creators of literary and artistic archives are subjection, subjected to the rejection of their work as ahistorical. The paradox of this framing does not escape Palestinians who having been ejected from a hegemonic historical archive, developed or expanded upon cultural methods of historical preservation through alternate routes of archival that were then rejected again. We can see this taking place in fact this very week with the release of the Palestinian Jordanian Darin Salem's first feature length film Farha on Netflix. Salam has stated that this film is inspired by the real life experience of a young refugee girl named Radiya in a story that traveled to her across the space of exile and the time of intergenerational transmission. As Salam has recounted, quote, Radiya was a girl who lived in Palestine during the Nakba. Her father locked her in the pantry to protect her during the war. Her stepmother then let her out and they both survived, making it to Syria. The father disappeared. After Radia went to Syria, she met a little girl and told her the story. That little girl was my mother. The film has provoked not only predictable rejections by Israeli leaders, but also media and collective campaigns denouncing the film. These denunciations come from those threatened by the light that a large platform like Netflix might shed on the history of Zionist settler colonial violent extinctions of Palestinian life, and therefore as an extension, the light this sheds upon the present, 
unsettling the state's long-standing narrative of violence as a tool of defense rather than as a tool of conquest. So in the very short minute or so I have left, what does this mean for the future of the Palestinian past in literature and the arts? I think returning to Salem is generative here. She says she is frequently asked why she chose to do a period piece for her first feature film when, quote, there are so many stories happening in Palestine today. Her response is instructive. Palestine, she says, existed. There was life there, people living with their hopes and ambitions. In other words, the context of Palestinian life now in the present and 1948 in the past have changed and have not changed, not only because settler colonial tactics of extraction, dispossession, erasure, and death continue, but more importantly, because Palestinian life continues and we are instructed and tethered to one another as Palestinians by the lessons of our ancestors. The relationship between Palestinian literature and Palestinian history, in other words, is not only, although certainly, political and resistive to erasure. This relationship between literature, creative culture, and history is also integral to Palestinian being and will continue to be so long after the fall of settler colonial regimes. Um, and I know I, I jumped around a lot through literature, so I'm also happy to um, expand on in, any of the things addressed uh, in that little overview. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Batisse, for your contribution. Um, I see that there is a question uh, for both of you, actually. Um, can, from Fidel Gonzalez, can we use literature to recover the voices of the non allied people of the past? Um, yes, I, I, I believe we can. Um, I think that a really interesting um, take on this is uh, Adania Shibli's most recent work, um, why well, it's right here, uh, Minor Detail. Um, it's a very interesting exploration of recapturing the narrative of the voiceless and the challenges, uh, well, we shouldn't say the voiceless, of the made made into uh, beings that are presumed voiceless um, because the novel interrogates the journey of a, um, of a journalist or a historian who is attempting to recuperate the narrative of a young Bedouin uh, girl who, is murdered um, during the Israeli um, colonization of the Naqab of the Negev Desert. And in, in the retelling of her narrative, um, she still struggles to take on prominence um, as a character in the sense that in the first part of the story, uh, it is narrated from the point of view uh, of an Israeli general. And then of course, in the second part of the story, as this journalist attempts to recuperate this information, um, she, she really struggles to find the documents that she's looking for uh, and in the end com comes to a tragic end because of it. So it is, it is really a tracing of both the challenges of the historian in finding these narratives within colonial archives, because this is where she's ultimately searching, coming to the realization at the end that she's been looking in the wrong places. Um, and so, I mean, can they, can we give them, can their voices be uplifted? Absolutely. But I think as Dr. Saikali notes, um, so, so much more eloquently than, <laughs> than me, is that we can't erase the struggles that we face the contradictions um, in, in our own histories. We can't pretend that these histories haven't been erased. So part of telling that story is 
really uh, addressing the fact that these so many Palestinian archives are out of our reach um, because they've been looted or destroyed. Uh, so I think there's two, two, two kind of contradictory um, impetuses that have to be dealt with, that yes, we need to recuperate these nar narratives and also yes, they have been erased. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Sigley, you, you, you want? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank we you. say a word about it. No worries. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I want to say, because Fidel, thank you for your question, and you also ask about um, the question of the, the bourgeoisie and so on. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, I think that um, you can read uh, uh, middle class writing in a way that it allows you to critique their own class position and subjectivity. And this is what I tried to do in Men of Capital, right? This is the way that you read for not simply the fight against Zionism, but also the internal class articulations, formations. Um, and if you do that carefully, you understand, as I as I note in Men of Capital, that for a lot of the middle class actors that I studied, uh, uh, social mobility and the challenge from the working classes and the subaltern classes were actually even more threatening the, to them in the in 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 the late twenties and early thirties than the Zionists themselves. And that allows us to understand the ways that uh, um, especially middle class and elite actors in Palestine were unable until it was too late to understand the domestic worker, the Bedouin, the Falah as not simply historical objects, but historical subjects. So those are important class-based lessons that we must take to inform our present, that's number one. Number two, in my own experience and the book I'm working on now is about the this very strange coincidence in which I learned six months after Men of Capital came out that I wrote a book about my own family without knowing it. Um, and, and this is to say that um, uh, family archives, family papers are also archives. So I think one of the gifts of being stateless is that it offers us a way to think about archives as multiple and to be very creative about where we go to access those archives. And so for while for the mo many of us, the archives inside um, the Green Line are inaccessible, it's also a way to think about, okay, you can go, for example, to um, municipality archives. You can go to uh, 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 various town archives. You can, you know, there are multiple creative ways to look in different places for the story. So in my own experience, I looked at a set of files for um, by uh, the economic advisor during the British mandate. Nobody had really looked at those files. I spent a lot of times looking at files about tomatoes and cucumbers and nobody had looked at them. And there you could find the petitions of farmers, of regular working people, of their interaction with British colonial governance and their interaction with um, elite institutions. That takes me to my third point. I think um, the lessons of Gayatri Spivak and Can the Subaltern Speak are often misread because people um, are anti-intellectual and sometimes sexist, but regardless of those broader things, um, I think for me, what that piece, what I hold on to from that piece is that she says to us, your job is not to speak on behalf of the subaltern, but rather to listen to the subaltern. So I think we have to move away from a kind of approach that is about recovery or salvation, because that recovery salvation approach is itself part of the problem. And here I'll just end with, a note uh, about um, drawn from a, a, a wonderful PhD candidate um, who I work with here at UCSB, 
and she works in Egypt. And this just gives you an example um, of, of, of kind of archival innovation, right? So a lot of people have written about Egypt and there are there because in part, because there's a huge archive there. Uh, and a lot of people have been written about the question of law and criminal justice. What she's now doing is looking at the cat at the at the village headman or the amda, right, um, all throughout Egypt, and she's making this point that there are these kinds of village archives that allow us to understand what is happening in the realm of law and criminality not in Cairo or Alexandria, but in this broader expanse where most of the people live. So my, my point about innovation is just as true for the archival um, um, quest, I think, as it is for the analytical. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, and I think, yes, there is a last question which is, is there an opening for Palestine studies in creating intellectual space because so much of Israel studies is not theoretically well-developed? I'm just gonna jump in here and I'll let um, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Batar say to uh, say uh, what she'd like. I don't, I think the, um, I don't think we should think of work in that way. I don't like that's a real two state solution approach to things like there's this and then there's this. Um, Palestine studies is older than Israel studies. It isn't confined by a political project that wants to put forward a parity between a colonized state and a colonized people. And I think it's less about what's developed and what isn't. And it's more about envisioning decolonial futures. And I think the best of Palestinian studies is a decolonial practice. Um, we still have a lot of work to do before we can get there. Um, and I hope that Israel studies um, also begins its own uh, process of decolonization. I don't feel that that is the labor of Palestinian scholars. I think that is the labor of Israeli scholars. And I know that there are um, generations of people who are interested in doing that and, and, and beginning to do that work. Thank you. Um, yeah, Professor Battersea, would you have some a word to say about it? I certainly can't, um, can't say it any better than that. Um, I think I, I would take a second, uh, though, while we wait to see if there's any more questions to uplift what Dr. Saifadi mentioned about the Palestinian Feminist Collective, because it really touches on all three points um, that she addressed about time, collaborative labor and the archive um, as a space in which we recently put, produced a calendar that has a multiple purpose of both um, uplifting our present collaborative work and drawing from our ancestors and our histories um, to, to educate ourselves really um, and as a, a platform in which to develop further praxis. Um, so in that calendar, again, that which was collectively created and, and includes the artwork of 15 Palestinian artists uh, across the diaspora and in historic Palestine, um, we developed principles that are centered each month um, that pull from our histories, whether it's the 1987 uh, Intifada and popular uprising, or um, the concept of Samud uh, that we derive from the resistance of our Palestinian prisoners for Palestinian Prisoners Day. And so I think that's another way to think about how, um, you know, this, this kind of digging into our, our history um, and looking at both those things that fuel our movement and also our uncomfortable truths um, continues as a collective labor for all of us, a necessary one. Um, and again, as we both noted, uh, the way in which we continue to learn from our from our ancestors, and also to push against these this notion of only pulling from elite histories. Um, 
So anyway, I encourage anyone to look that up if they're interested. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Yes, there is another question, which is, is it useful to go back to a pre-nation state framework? Um, I think it's important to understand Palestine through its multiple regimes of rule, imperial, colonial, nation state. Um, I think it's always important to think, as I noted, before and beyond the nation state. Um, so yes, I think it's very useful and important and crucial, but I also think we we shouldn't um, romanticize either. So I think for a, for a period of time, there was in um, Palestine studies and Middle East studies, a little bit of a longing for a kind of Ottoman past in response to a lot of the more Arab nationalist renditions of, of you know, the Ottoman period as just 500 years of stasis. Um, so, you know, the thing that centers me is always asking the hard questions and never taking for granted any inherited argument that we have. Yeah, and just jumping off of that, um, what Dr. Saikali already brought in is the necessity of looking not only to our past, but to our futures. So, I mean, of course, it is formative to look at um, the long history of Palestine that comes before the nation state structure, but we also need to continue to, to be, um, to invest in, in innovative thought uh, for our futures as well. So um, that we, we ensure, you know, better futures, not returns to an idealized past. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Yes, I think that's it for the questions. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution, both your contributions. It was a real pleasure to...